Continuing on with Nintendo Power, as we come to issue 105 for February of 1998. Our cover game this issue is WCW vs. NWO World Tour, which I covered last, last issue, so this will streamline things a little. In the letters column, we have a weird debate over whether Tetris is the best or worst game of all time. I we have like several letter writers candidly, aggressively arguing for the thought that Tetris is the worst game ever made, worse than Shaq Fu, which is a take in any case. Um, thankfully, the majority of the letter writers are on the side of Tetris and are not, in fact, um, truly have people with, with horrible taste. We have people with good taste. They, they, they acknowledge Tetris as for what it is. We also have a bunch of letters dunking on Goldeneye and complaining about the low score that Mischief Makers got. Okay. In the power charts, we have a bunch of new titles appearing on the list. We have WCW versus NWO World Tour appearing on the N64, along with Mortal Kombat Mythology Sub-Zero, again, showing no accounting for taste. On the Super Nintendo side, we have Kirby's Dream Land 3, along with WWF WrestleMania, the arcade, and WWF Raw. For WCW vs. NWO World Tour, we have expanded coverage of the game with a partial move list. Um, like, it's, it's not complete. For example, Eddie Guerrero is not in here, who was the person who I did my capture with last time. And again, I previously covered this game already, so let's move on to the next game. Next up is Nagano Winter Olympics 98, the first Olympic game for the N64, and the first Olympics with snowboarding. And we have notes on all the events. Nagano Winter Olympics has the core problem that most Olympic sports have. They are great when playing against other people, not so much against yourself computer, and this is not helped by the game. We're trying a rather significant amount of save space in the memory module. Again, as of this recording, nobody's reco invented a N64 memory module will take a micro SD card to handle all of this nonsense with game save file size. And then, what is probably for a first so far, we have a separate Olympics hockey game for this year's games, but it's also a reskinned Wayne Gretzky's 3D Hockey 98. As I previously reviewed the parent game, and Nintendo Power explicitly states that this is a version of the game with no gameplay changes, um, not even like a significant overhaul to reflect Olympic rule, uh, hockey rules versus NHL hockey rules or a more arcadey style of play, I will also give this game a miss. We have a proper strategy guide for Yoshi's story on the N64, which I also covered last issue, so I'm just going to say the game gets more in-depth on the gameplay mechanics, along with some level maps and level-specific notes and stuff on progression, and I will move on from there. In the classified information column, we have a bunch of little cheats for San Francisco Rush, along with the usual other variety of games. Goemon is back with Legend of the Mystical Ninja 64, and we have maps of some of the early areas of the game. Legend of the Mystical Ninja 64 is an interesting game to look at, considering that this game is getting covered in Nintendo Power prior to the release of Ocarina of Time. Specifically, the game uses some of the concept of the Zelda or Metroid style of game, not in terms of Metroidvania, but in the sense of more uh, zelda Troid, I guess? Um, getting new items that unlock new areas of the map, combined with having a tightly controlled series of level environments to introduce these concepts to the player without overwhelming them in the navigation process. Uh, something we're going to see later in Ocarina of Time with the Deku Tree. However, Mystical Ninja 64 takes these concepts and combines them with the 3D platforming framework of Mario 64, but it doesn't handle it quite as well. This is particularly aggravated by the game's camera. It tries to slowly automatically move behind the character to help track their movement, but without providing any control for the level environments because movement in the game is mapped to the analog stick and C buttons are mapped to item, character, and ability selection as opposed to how it's done in Mario 64. And there isn't really a good like snap to camera behind the player 
button here either. Now Mario 64 minimized this problem by using the C buttons for camera and also scaling down Mario's abilities to jump and punch. There is no fire flower. There is no um, raccoon tail or anything like that in Mario 64. It's just the base level stuff. Less abilities even if you look at it than in Super Mario Brothers on the NES. Now, in a weird way, had the N64 used a controller layout much similar to the PlayStation without having that sort of third chunk in the middle where the analog stick is, or if Konami had instead decided not to use the analog stick and use the D-pad for movement, this might actually be less of an issue because then the bumpers could have been used for camera rotation on a horizontal axis. Wouldn't have given us vertical movement, but having that additional camera movement from again on just on the horizontal really makes up for a lot in terms of helping the player navigate the environments still mystical ninja 64 is a good series of steps in the right direction towards what we will eventually get with ocarina of time we're just not quite there yet arguably i would say that this is certainly an instance where looking in the big picture Legend of the Mystical Ninja 64 is harmed by having come out before Ocarina of Time, far enough in advance that developers would not necessarily have had a chance to see how Nintendo solved these problems in terms of handling a fairly complicated control and equipment setup and ability arrangement and also camera lock on camera movement and for navigating in these environments before they got started, the same way that a lot of other developers for platformers benefited from Nintendo having done Mario 64 first and learned and provided a bunch of basically guidelines for how to handle camera movement, character movement in a 3D environment, particularly using the N64 controller. Moving on. We have a bunch of cheat codes for Diddy Kong Racing, which is nice. We also have more special moves for Fighter's Destiny, which I have previously reviewed, so I'm moving on to the next game. We have the sequel of to Cruisin' USA with Cruisin' World. We have a bunch of preview coverage of the game, including its additional game modes, but this is otherwise a standard preview with no real track maps or anything like that, so I'm just going to save this one for later. We have a futuristic racing game that is clearly trying to come out before F-Zero did and also trying to capitalize on the success of Wipeout on the PlayStation console with Aero Gauge. We have notes on the vehicles, including one of the hidden vehicles, which is an N64 controller. And we have a few level maps. Aero Gauge is more of a flying car racing game than your standard cling tight to the ground while going super fast racing game like Wipeout or F-Zero but you're still going super fast, to be clear. The game plays fairly well, but it's definitely something that is very dependent on getting very clean runs and getting the course written more flawlessly than other similar races. I did have fun playing this game, but it's not without some weird issues with the controls and how it handles things like getting a quick start off the line. I always found that the other racer is able to get that very quick start could nail it for whatever reason. We have our next soccer game from EA with FIFA 98, and we have the full team lineup. FIFA 98 plays honestly a lot better than the previous FIFA game. It felt more comfortable with the controls. Ultimately, I was able to get a better idea of what I would needed to be doing in the Move game away from team, danger. and was able to well better, the ball from underneath him. I was able to get a match. Well played. I felt like how passing is done was communicated better uh, in terms of who the active player is. Uh, tackles and defensive maneuvers felt better. Um, I didn't get too much into like the advanced shot mechanics and that sort of thing, but what we got worked for me. I really appreciated it. And I had a lot of fun playing. Green sliding tackle. Our first of two Game Boy games this issue is James Bond 007 on the Game Boy. We have a full set of level maps and environment maps for the game. 
Demon Bond 007 ostensibly takes cues from Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening. Your character has two verbs you can select through your inventory menu, one for A, one for B, either by performing an action or using an item, depending on what you selected, with the player also being able to talk to characters and explore the environment outside of the action elements of the game. The problem is, is Link's Awakening has tremendously expressive and well-designed sprites that have a lot of character and flair to them, which helps give the island a sense of place and helps make the characters and the place you're in hearing, which in turn gives the conclusion of the game significantly more impact. James Bond 007 just doesn't. For example, the China stage is meant to serve as the game's opening area basically draws all its character from stereotypes, from conical hats on characters, traditional Chinese roof lines, the tone of the music. When the designing the level environments, the developer either didn't have the time or the inclination to go beyond that, to do more involved sprites or that sort of thing. Um, it tries to do some stuff in other areas, like when you go back to London and you're in MI6, you go to the branch, they do a couple little bits to evoke elements from various Q sequences in earlier movies, like the sofa bit from, I believe, um, Goldeneye, and that sort of thing. But it otherwise, like, I don't have the sense of Q being Desmond Llewellyn and his mannerisms outside of some dialogue and his sprite being a slightly different color no sense of him reprimanding Bond or anything of the sort. It's kind of a bummer because the idea of taking the Link's Awakening range of gameplay and crossing it with Bond has the potential to be awesome, but you have to be willing to take the time and go, okay, we're not going to go for realism in terms of a realistic human proportion sprite here. We're going to be more stylized to convey both the sense of drama and the sense of humor that comes with Bond, especially when we get into the Pierce Brosnan era. In Counselor's Corner, speaking of Bond, we have a bunch more secrets for GoldenEye 007, along with also Duke Nukem 64. Our second Game Boy game of the issue is a write-up of the Game Boy port of Maui Mallard in Cold Shadow, including a bunch of level maps. The Game Boy version of Maui Mallard is kind of a mess to play. We have less information on screen at any given time when it comes to the level environments. It's more of a hassle to switch between weapon types due to the reduced number of buttons and simply grabbing ropes and environments to climb to access more vertical elements is considerably more difficult. It's like Maui Mallard, the original had a, on the SNES had a bunch of problems already, but those problems were brought on by being over ambitious with the animations which in turn made, took precision away from the game. Here, it's limitations of the, of the system, both graphically and control-wise, making it more difficult to play by making it harder to navigate the environments. In all, neither one is great, but this one is, the Game Boy version is certainly the lesser version of the game. In the now playing column, we finally have an also ran with NBA in the Zone 98. And in the Pack Watch column, we have the announcement of the Game Boy Pocket, plus Quake 64, and Wario Land 2. My pick of the issue is, surprisingly for me, FIFA 98. Yeah, like, I, I, I'm surprised with myself too. This is one of the few sports games outside of racing and wrestling where I picked up the title for this show and played it and had fun doing it. And not just because I wanted the match, it's because I felt I was at a good grasp of the action and understood what I was doing and was able to put that into action in a way that I was able to make headway in the game. I mean, yes, it does in fact tie into me having won, but the point is feeling like I won because of my own skill as opposed to the difficulty not being calibrated well or anything like that, or feeling that the game's AI in terms of the difficulty was weighted too far against me. I'm certainly, if I picked a more difficult opponent to play against, I would have gotten 
it's raffle stomped, but I picked it that I, when I do these matches for test play and for game capture and that sort of thing, I pick opponents who are equal to each other. And so I was pleased with how this turned out. And I had fun doing this, and I would certainly look forward to playing the game more in the future in general. So, again, that's my pick for for the month. Um, I actually have a, honestly have a decent multiplayer pick this month too. With well, Olympics, um, not going to Winter Olympics '98. This type of track and field style Olympic game thrives not in a single player environment, not in a playing it by yourself but as a somewhat de facto party game. And this game handles four player really well. So if you're, if you're not doing a four player soccer match and you want like a few pick up and play smaller bite sized things, then certainly Nagano Olympics 98 is a pretty good fit for that. Good pass. And straight at the keeper, that one. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. And also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any f future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.